Hi, Grace. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks. Good. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Elliott, uh, curator of live programs at uh, Bergen Kunsthalle. I'm joined today by Grace Nduritu. Uh, on the occasion of this year's Bergen Art Book Fair, the eighth edition, this is a collaborative uh, endeavor for us. Um, I'd like to start by introducing Grace, of course. Um, Grace Nduritu is a British Kenyan artist uh, whose artworks are concerned with the transformation of our contemporary world. Nduritu has been featured in Time magazine, Fiden's 21st Century Art Book, Art Monthly, and Elephant magazine, with her works being housed in museum collections such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Council, and the Modern Art Museum in Warsaw, to name but a few. And today, Grace, you're joining me from Brussels, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start uh, our conversation today with a pretty straightforward question. Um, your works really uh, highlight a multiplicity of practice and some might see as kind of divergent interests in a contemporary art world. You also are very much engaged in this idea of the non-rational, so to speak. We will delve into that a bit more in a, a few minutes. But first of all, I wanted to start by asking, why did you become an artist? What made you want to become an artist in the first place? Well, I think it was, uh, you could say, an accidental uh, endeavor in the sense that as a child, I was very interested in um, maybe becoming like a philosopher or an inventor because I was always thinking about new ways of thinking about life and new types of concepts. And I was already writing a lot. I was writing this kind of fact fiction um, kind of writing. And so um, I was also really interested in fashion and textile art. Um, so I actually studied textile art in England, and then I went moved to Amsterdam to do a postgrad, um, where I started making videos. And um, for those years, I was kind of making videos, trying to find my own vocabulary. I was really into like um, land art and body art, so artists from the '60s like Bruce Nauman, Anna Mendetta, Marina Abramovic. You know, and then actually after I left school, uh, I left Atelier's, um, I really already had begun a very deep esoteric practice. So I already had like a guru, I was already doing meditation retreats from a young age. And so I continued these two um, separate, having a double life, let's say. Hmm. And uh, in my art practice, I was starting to make like performance videos. So performing, in trance, so I would put myself in trance and perform in front of a video camera. And then uh, I would also go on these trips to places like uh, Mali in West Africa or Alaska. And I would like film, um, I would film, but I would perform behind the camera. And my work at that time was always about nonlinear states of mind and trance, but mostly through the editing process or the performing process. And this is really rooted, you could say, um, to my background. So I grew up, um, my family's from rural Kenya. So I grew up there, but I also grew up in a working class uh, neighborhood in Birmingham, in England. So I have this kind of opposite contrasting, um, you know, childhood of being in these two spaces. Um, and then my mother, she was kind of unusual for an African mother. She was... Um, she was a feminist and her and her friends set up this group called Women in the Third World and they would have film screenings and they'd go on protest marches, so anti-apartheid marches. So from a young age, we were very political, very activist. And we also had a lot of spiritual books in the household, like Buddhist books, Hindu books. Mm. Um, I went to Catholic school, but I'm not Catholic. And these kind of all informed my art practice later on and why people might think I have quite a diverse or divergent interests. It really comes from that kind of melting pot, you could say, of ideas from 
from young. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I guess to contextualize this a bit more, um, you touched on it there, speaking about moving to, is it Mali? Um, yeah, yeah, working in Mali and traveling, uh, I worked and traveled with some Tuareg nomadic people. Mm. There. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in different communities, um, indigenous communities, but also um, hippie um, alternative communities like permaculture communities. That's yeah. been important to me. Yeah, so I guess this moving off grid um, is really informed certain parts of your practice, such as the arc um, and this balance between working as an artist in institutions today and uh, as a more kind of nomadic uh, practice. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more on this idea of working off grid and how it has informed such such works as the arc? Yeah, so I guess uh, for me, yeah, for a young age, I've been like as a family, we were, you know, going between these two spaces of Kenya and um, England. But um, as a young adult, I was already interested in traveling to India, to Morocco. Um, and I'd already done some kind of woofing, which is like organic mm -hmm. helping on organic farms in New Zealand and going to Burning Man in Nevada. Like I went to Burning Man when I was by myself when I was quite young. So I'd already had these kind of experiences. And then I decided um, after living in Amsterdam, I'd moved to London and I'd like uh, gone, particularly because I thought in Amsterdam, I felt I'd, I'd been there five years. I felt like, you know, I knew everything about the city, let's say. And I wanted a different environment. And London is actually the complete opposite. It's very career focused. But I thought that could be interesting, good for me. But after like six, seven years, I found it quite heavy, the energy. And um, in that time, I was still having different esoteric practices and teachers and things. And I decided to leave London and go and live in nature. So I came up with this idea of living in rural spaces. Um, and, you know, so I lived in a forest, in a van, uh, near Stonehenge. I lived in different uh, monasteries. I lived with the Hare Krishnas. Mm -hmm. And the idea was only to go to the city if necessary. So there was this idea of this urban-rural dialogue that came up of only using the urban when needed, like for a meeting or you know, an exhibition or something like that. Mm. Otherwise, I would always try and stay in nature. And out of doing this for many years, you know, and just like literally just having two suitcases and living this nomadic life, um, you know, I, I came to, you know, because I'm an artist, obviously, when I was living in these communities, I start to think, why am I here? What am I doing? You know, sort of questions. Because it was a kind of, um, I'm very interested in lived research, let's say, uh, rather than just reading books, I'd rather just go and do the thing. And so um, in living in these communities as well, I'd seen a lot of the problems with individual and group dynamics, you know, because the idea of living in a community is so utopian. And, you know, this kind of thing of like thinking, oh, um, this, these communities could resolve, they won't have the same issues in, as in the city. But in the communities, I discovered racism, sexism, classism as well. And so after many years of doing this kind of research, um, I, I could have just like basically made an exhibition, obviously, you know, because I, I was taking photos, mostly of the architecture and things, but I was doing it just for me. You know, I did all the same jobs as everyone in the community. I had the same schedule. You know, I'd get up, I'd clean, I'd do laundry, you know, I'd work in the cafe or in the laundry or in the kitchen or whatever. And then, um, but in the end, I decided to do a project called the ARC uh, Centre for Interdisciplinary Experimentation, which is where I set up my own community. And so that was like a, a crazy, fun, intense experience where I invited scientists and artists and spiritual people to come together and live together um, off grid in an in Paris, so in an urban city. And uh, there we had like quite a strict daily schedule of different types of activities. 
that we would do uh, spiritual activities, intellectual activities, uh, physical activities, um, creative activities. And so it was kind of part scientific experiment, part spiritual experience within this yeah, art um, setting. Uh, but I see it as more as a, as a model, um, the arc as a model for living off grid in an urban setting. Mm. Do, do you reckon that seeing those problems from, let's say, regular society emerging in these communities, do you see that maybe as a reason to kind of resist creating uh, a a definitive answer through the arc. I guess like when, when you saw racism, sexism, and all these struggles exist in these other communities, I guess it makes the arc less of a kind of decisive moment. It's, it's a bit more of a possible space, I suppose, than... I mean, the arc is contradictory in the sense of it's off-grid in an urban mm -hmm. setting, and normally you'd have to go to nature to be off-grid. Yeah. but. In the art, for example, we had like, um, it was set in Laboratoire Aubervilliers, so in Paris, mm. an art centre. Yeah. And so we took over the building, we built a dormitory in the blackout theatre space. We had our own kitchen, we had our own garden, uh, we grew some food there, we had, um, uh, we built an outdoor shower, and we couldn't basically leave that space for a certain amount of time, you know. Um, so that we wouldn't be influenced from the outside world. We also didn't have um, the staff, you know, who would normally work in the space. They didn't come into our space. So we were like really in our own bubble. You know, we didn't have TV, we didn't have radio, we didn't have, we didn't even have watches. We just had a gong um, that would like wake everyone up and then like put everyone to <laughs> tell us when it's time to go to bed. So you have like a rhythm, like on a retreat, um, you start to, time starts to expand. And for me, that's really important when, you know, you ask me about these non-rational methodologies, mm. um, what that is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nice. That really like brings me back to our first conversation or somewhat, uh, online speed date, <laughs> learning so much about uh, each other through this connection through, I guess, more historical methodologies, how to kind of re reconstruct the, the institution of today doing that. So to go back to our first conversation, I guess, uh, when we met through this discussion about reconstructing archives or speculating upon a history, this means imagining what the institution of today could have looked like if another demographic or collective had really taken more power in the past. And I think there's a there's a strongly embodied element to your artworks that's looking at this today. I know elsewhere you've spoken about the need for non-rational methodologies, such as through the ARC, to be reintroduced into the museum structure. Um, what is it about these extra linguistic or corporeal ways of being with others that is most important to your practice, uh, or especially through projects like Healing the Museum and the Ark? Yeah, I think for me, um, the reason why I began the project Healing the Museum in 2012 was because I just honestly felt that museums were kind of dying mm -hmm. because they just felt so cut off with what was going on outside. Um, not only politically, but demographically, just energetically. And so I was starting to think about how to bring new energies into museums. So you can obviously bring new audiences, but also literally bringing new energies through yoga, meditation, shamanism. Um, yeah, and new ways of working with people, like collaborating with people. And so Healing the Museum, um, I also, it's, it's a long-term body of work. So I could give you an example uh, of one, um, one part of it. So in 2017, um, I did a, um, a project um, in the Healing Museum body of work called A Meal for My Ancestors. Mm -hmm. And this was in Brussels. So this was just after uh, the bombing had taken place in 2016. 
and when the refugee crisis was like you know really getting heated up you know and um i was interested in focusing on trauma how do we heal trauma so using art uh, meditation shamanism and food and so what i did was i worked with two sets of people i worked with um, a group of people which consisted of refugees activists and migrants and I worked with staff members um, who work in agencies like uh, the UN, NATO and the EU Parliament. And so I worked with these two sets of people um, for four months separately. So I gave meditation, free meditation classes to the refugees and activists. And then I gave creative visualization uh, workshops to the staff members of the agencies. Mm. Because both sets of people were dealing with the, the trauma and the refugee crisis in different ways. So obviously refugees and activists, they have, um, they, they have a precarious living situation uh, usually. And so they have a lot of anxiety um, in the mind. So it's, all, it's about calming the mind down. Whereas people who work in you know, agencies or big institutions like the parliament usually have quite um, a comfortable living situation. But their issue is that they don't have the ability to make creative decisions because they have so much bureaucracy and they can't really think outside of the box because of the, you know, the kind of power that their decisions have to make, you know, in terms of the, the, the thousands or millions of people that they have to, you know, that their decisions can affect. So I gave them a creative visualization techniques. And then after four months, I brought them both, the two sets of people together, and we did a shamanic performance. Um, and that was really powerful because here's a group of people with very different needs that really never meet. They only ever meet when there's a crisis. And here they were gonna meet under, let's say more positive circumstances. And so what happened is everybody lay on the floor and of course everyone's power dynamics went away because when you're on the floor, you're just a body. It doesn't matter if you're the head of the terrorist department or you're head of this, you know, you're just the body, aren't you? And so it was quite a bonding experience. And of course people saw different things, but a lot of people saw things about climate change and about climate change um, refugees. They saw visions of that in their shamanic journeys. And so we had some amazing results come out of it. Um, that weekend, um, I should say uh, as well, I decided to um, have a little conference. So I invited a shaman to come in and talk about the benefits of trance, a healing trance. And I also invited a medical doctor to talk about um, the healing benefits of eating together. And then I asked the public uh, to bring food, um, to you know donate food to the project. So like 90 people came and they all bought all sorts of food. So we had this shared meal together. And that was like really amazing because the idea was that we would have a spiritual meal, but we'd have an actual meal. And then, um, yeah, out of that, it was really funny because one of the women, yeah, because I had different types of people. So in the agency, like I said, I had someone from the terrorist department. I also had a high court judge from Lille. And so he makes really hard decisions every day about what to do with, um, you know, really take the worst cases you know, for refugees, what to do with them. So these are refugees trying to get to England through Lille uh, or Calais, and he has to decide what to do with them. So he was part of the project and also um, a guy from NATO as well and a woman from the Foreign Office. And so, yeah, the woman from the Foreign Office, she really got into the shamanic part and she was really inspired by um, what she saw in her vision about climate change and about climate change refugees specifically because now right now the law um, doesn't actually give them status you can have status as a refugee if you're fleeing a war or a genocide but you can't have it if you're fleeing a climate um, disaster mm. so she decided to start a think tank about this in the parliament and she wrote a paper about this 
And so to me, this was fascinating about how something very practical and um, let's say functional can come out of something um, non-rational, something performative, something artistic and something spiritual. And yeah, that, that taught me a lot about um, yeah, the power of working together with people in this, my new, you know, this invent, the way that I'd invented this kind of new methodologies of using these kind of esoteric methods to actually work on practical issues. Mm. Yeah, I really wanted to, I, I was curious about like what the manifestations of this non-rational method could be because this, it, you create this infrastructure for gathering in circles that really shifts the storytelling away from uh, what we're very much used to in a kind of uh, a westernized format of storytelling or more pragmatic uh, form based on reading or uh, documents in this case with NATO. But uh, this has really evolved into some kind of more sort of hopeful format of protest in a way, a kind of embracing the the competence of the collective mind as well. And I, I think it's a uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's really interesting when you speak about new methodologies because it's maybe not uh, to me perceived as a new methodology. This is these are more like historically uh, common methodologies, for example, or like shamanic practice. Uh, yeah. but there's something very telling, or, or like of this moment, it, it seems very relevant to stop perhaps naively looking forward at the future, but what we can learn from those pasts and those past methodologies to, to create a more kind of hopeful present. No, of course, a lot of new methodology. I mean, shamanism is the first world religion, you know, yeah. that was everywhere in all cultures at some time. But when I say new methodology in, in terms of like within the contemporary art world, like Absolutely. people were not interested in this stuff like 10 years ago or when I was in art school, and I would talk about meditation, I would get picked on, I would get bullied about it. People were like, what, why are you doing that? Yep. Especially um, in England, when I moved back to England, um, people, because England's a very nihilistic, um, or let's say an atheist country, agnostic atheist. So it's more um, material based than, um, believing it was very hard for people to understand why i'd be interested in something spiritual you know and of course now there is obviously a lot of interest in spirituality especially since the pandemic but that's also to do with the fact that people have faced that in this crisis that they have to you know because of the lockdown they've had, had they've had more time to contemplate their own mortality and their own reality and so the interest in um, you know community and also thinking about something bigger has expanded you know and to me that's really key um, not only in my own practice but in my life that's what my life has been dedicated to yeah. so when I say new methodologies I mean just because of using it in the art context of art in a way to solve practical questions not actually the you know the, the spiritual practices are new. No, of course not. They couldn't be anyway, because it's to do with learning from lineage as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. I know there is some kind of resistance on your part in letting those practices that you're working with be adopted on too wide a scale, I think, it's particularly within institutional practice. Uh, could you speak a bit about the, the struggles that you find inherent in this way of working and maybe your your fears of it going a bit more widespread? Well, I guess it's like anything, you know, um, in, in the West especially, everything gets co-opted and becomes like a neoliberal um, branding of it. You know, we see in the word wellness and well-being being put everywhere. Wellness and well-being has got nothing to do with spirituality. Well, well-being is about psychology, you know, and let's say having good mental health. That doesn't mean you have a spiritual belief they're like completely, they can be completely separate things. But you can do yoga for just physical health, you know, and you can do yoga from an esoteric devotional practice um, space. So it's, 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 very, it's very complicated. Um, I think for institutions, um, 
yeah, institutions can obviously gobble things up <laughs> and, and knowingly or, you know, knowingly. But I do think the responsibility lies in the, with the artist in this case, because the artists who use these methodologies have to understand the power of what they're doing and the symbology of what they're using. So they have to have integrity with it. And the only way to have a true integrity is to have, um, yeah, to have learnt and have um, long-term experience. So, for example, on my website, I have two CVs. I have my art CV, but I have my spiritual CV going back 20 years. Doing my, you can see that I've been doing that uh, for a long time myself. Um, so um, I never ask people to do things that I haven't done hundreds of times. So it means that I can create a safe space because the idea of, you know, if you work with these methodologies, especially shamanism, you have to be able to hold the space, you know, and um, that means you have to have a lot of training in that. And you have to also understand that um, the different psychology of people, you know, and, as well as energy and things. So, yes, of course, in um, the modern um, contemporary art world, things can be flattened out, you know, and um, especially in the PR machine, when you've got Freeze Art Fair suddenly having an addition about spirituality, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, because it's nice to have that focus, let's say, this for once, actually, this year, I would say, since the pandemic, the pandemic has worked for my practice, I would say, and the fact that more, more people understand what I'm talking about now, you know, compared to, let's say, uh, last year or the year before, the year before, or the year before. Now, because more people are interested in these things, um, you know, I'm getting a more um, understanding or, you know, respectful mutual conversation about it. But how many people generally have a spiritual belief system? This is a very difficult thing to answer because usually that to have that kind of real belief system when something, whether you call it God, the universe, nature or mind or consciousness, it generally means that you've taken a risk to believe, to make that as a statement. And it generally means that usually you've had to go through something to mm -hmm. acquire that knowledge. And I don't feel that most people in the art world have gone through that process, you know, or not even just the art world. I mean, the general Western consumer world, you know, because most people don't like to feel uncomfortable. They want to feel, they want to stay in their safe. Um, they, they want it all. They want to, you know what I mean? They want, they want this higher knowledge, but they want to do it from their house or with their comfort, their modern day comforts, you know. And usually only this kind of knowledge and stuff is acquired by giving things up. And most people don't want to give anything up. So, you know, yeah. it, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah. well, things are becoming increasingly more divergent. I guess this, uh, the present becoming more increasingly divergent is this kind of moment where you suggest an alternative that incorporates uh, shamanism as a reaction against uh, capitalist structure, but uh, you also bring in this esoteric relationships to spaces as a form of healing um, on a maybe more widespread political idea. I would like to ask you a bit about this idea of the year of black healing and where, where that came from, because this is kind of taking that idea of uh, healing within the institution into a, a larger institution, the body politic, so to speak. Um, yeah. Could you could you talk a bit about this the year of black healing or what what that reaction came from? Yeah, so I started to think about the year of black healing last year, so two thousand and twenty, and so um, I kind of like put out a few feelers about it then, mm -hmm. and the year of black healing is basically my reaction to um, Ma President Macron, to the French president. Um, coming up with this idea of Africa 2020. So the idea was that there would be a season focused on Africa uh, for 2020. 
And one thing that really bothers me is when politicians hijack culture, uh, especially whether that's black culture or, um, you know, well, any culture, because in 2008, it was about China, you know, because the Olympics was going on. So we had lots of um, museum shows about China. And so um, 2020 was meant to be a, a similar season to do with Africa. And this was actually um, a distraction from the fact that in 2016, Macron had written, uh, well, he had a report about this idea of restitution of objects from museums back to Africa. And so none of the objects were sent back, you know, in those four years, and it became a huge controversy. And so I do feel like this Africa season was a kind of distraction. Uh, to do with that. And so, in my own part, um, the, heal, the year of black healing, it was about focusing on like anti racist, indigenous um, research about indigenous communities and black culture. And so, I began the year in the MOA, so that's the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, uh, working on a project there uh, with First Nations and also African diasporic uh, students there. And then I was in uh, Patagonia um, with Mapuche communities uh, there. And then obviously the pandemic happened. And so uh, the project turned to being a lot online. But what was really interesting is um, preceding the year of black healing. I've been involved in this two year project with the Goethe uh, called Everything Passes Except the Past. Uh, it's been curated by Jana Hackle. And Basically, it's been amazing where it's been a closed group of scientists, activists, academics, um, museum directors and artists from Africa and Europe going to different ethnological museums. Um, so in Brussels, Barcelona, Lisbon and Barcelona and debating this subject of restitution of objects. So the complexities of it, from the legal frameworks, uh, security issues, to um, you know, the more, let's say, artistic issues. Uh, so for example, I'll give you an example. Um, I did a performance in the Healing um, the Museum, body of work, in the African Museum in Brussels in Tiberden. And um, what happened was we had this closed workshop and we were in the museum. So the So it's um, a museum of all the, you know, relics from when Belgium colonised the Congo. Mm -hmm. So it has all the gems and the minerals, it has all the statues from all that kind of time. And so I got, what I did was I got everyone to sit in the German mineral room and to sit on the floor and to take their shoes off and to meditate together. And then we would talk about this idea of healing. And it became a very powerful um, experience because some of the artists and activists from Congo got really upset because obviously the gems in that room and the minerals, they're uh, blood diamonds, you know, they've come out of a situation. So it's very loaded, the energy in there. So they started to talk about that and, were, you know, and so it became a very cathartic experience. Um, so it meant that we kind of bonded as a group. And it was really funny because the director of that museum, he was part of the performance and he, he told me he'd never sat on his own museum floor in 20 years. And I couldn't believe it, you know, like, because the, one of the issues around that, uh, the African Museum in uh, Brussels is that it had been closed for 10 years to go through this issue of decolonizing the museum. The museum was meant to be decolonized. And most people would say nothing has changed. OK, and so I did this uh, performance after the museum reopened last year. And so, yeah, after we did this performance, what happened is that we had um, sessions then about, you know, the legal framework, about these practical issues. But because we've been through this weird, cathartic, powerful experience together, it meant that the issue, when we would talk about very practical things, we would talk much more as humans, much more personal about it. And um, 
yeah, the performance had its own life in the end, and it's actually been written about in Texas Kunst and it's a German art magazine and other things because it, it became this kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the results of that performance. Um, um, there was uh, this year in October, the year of Black Hill, and we ended up doing an exhibition in uh, Fondazzi's Sandretto in uh, Torino, uh, Italy. And uh, now there's going to be a book um, that uh, Jana Hackel is, um, is publishing with Sternberg about this Everything Passes Except the Past project. And I'm happy because it means my essays, Healing the Museum, and um, ways of seeing a new museum story for planet Earth will be in that book, as well as writings by all these scientists and academics, you know, because it's a very complicated issue. So the year of Black Healing, it's been working different ways, you know, on a bigger scale, like with bigger projects, but also through live research, like mm -hmm. I said, working with indigenous community, or through anti-racist work, and um, yeah, yeah thank you yeah um protest and things so yeah yeah i i was reading yesterday actually i think uh something from hannah black i think it was in freeze magazine perhaps where she mm -hmm. says the riot cannot uh resurrect the dead but it can resurrect the dead spaces of cities this has kind of uh reminded me a lot of uh, the year of black healing mm -hmm. um what what are you hopeful for with this method? Well, again, it's about coming up with new ideas. I mean, that's the whole thing about healing a museum. It's about tapping in, because the West is very um, left brain focused, you know, mm -hmm. in the sense of most of the world believes in um, animism. It believes in something bigger. It's only in the West that this, there's this focus on the left brain. And so i um, very interested in um, trying to balance the two brain hemispheres. So I use these methodologies so that we can tap into the right brain, you know, so um, you can come up with different answers to issues where we've got stuck. So these long-term issues, you know, uh, where we're just going around in circles, these political issues, is because we're only using the left brain. So that's what I'm hopeful for. You know, I've just written actually an essay that will be published um, next week by Philip. Um, mm. it's, um, it's a magazine and a journal in uh, Vancouver, and it's called Healing the Healing of America. And it talks about how um, in post US election, uh, how um, I guess the left can deal with the fact of trying to move on. And um, and what that actually means, you know, you know, logically, but also um, community-wise and energetically and things. And this, uh, there's this line in it says, the healing of America will be the healing of us all, you know, because there's so much um, power, you know, in the sense of like, this could be a whole new phase, a whole new era in the sense of like understanding that we just went through four years of hell, you yeah. know? And so how to um, not just forget about that, you know, and try to, you know, bury it, but actually how to use it, you know, to move on. And so, yeah, for me, that's important. This idea of transformation and transmutation is a key thing in my work. Um, because usually my work is thinking about time in terms of, like I said, non-linear time and deep time. So um, these expanded ideas of time in terms of what we do as human beings, you know, we're just this little blip now. Um, but everything that we're doing, you know, I see, I see myself as a contemporary artist, obviously. I live now and I work with issues from now, but I'm still very connected to these other, these other selves that lived before in the past. So there's a me 50,000 years ago, as well as there's a me right now, and there's a me 5,000 years into the future. So there's always something ancient, prehistoric in my work, even though I'm a contemporary person now. And so I think that's uh, really important um, when thinking about, you know, how to progress as humans. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, this idea of yeah aspirational uh, constructs from the collective through the institution is something that also uh, is very uh, present in another project of yours, which is uh, talking a bit more about a recent history, uh, maybe perhaps the 1990s, uh, through the work of Cover Slot, which is uh, something we'll focus on now. Um, I, your backdrop is a Cover Slot uh, pattern, right? It's, not it's, 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 <laughs> it's from the cult of the kimono collection. The kimono, yeah, exactly. Um, but in the 1990s, you, is, which is, I know you hold very dearly this moment of aspiration where performing something new or what you want to see represented on a wider scale is something that the project cover slot really embraces. Uh, this reminds me of Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning, where this idea of something you don't experience in society directly is something that you can create for yourself. Uh, again, through the power of collective and uh, alternative forms of protest, be that ballroom dance, um, yeah, countless other queer methodologies that we embrace. Um, but before you talk to us through the selection of the collections from Cover Slot, could you give me a bit of background on the birth of the project? Where, where was Cover Slot born or how was it born? Yes, yeah, so the birth of Cover Slot. So just I should tell you, perhaps um, maybe you and all the viewers don't know what the word Cover Slut means. So the word Cover Slut is actually, it's a brilliant word because it's actually a word from the 17th century. That's a British word and it, it's about a kitchen apron. Um, so it's an apron, a type of textile cloth that a kitchen maid uh, would wear. And so um, to cover up their dirty clothes, that's what a natural cover slip was. And so I like the ideas um, that there's politics embedded in the word cover slip already, not a feminist discourse, class discourse, because um, cover slip is a label, fashion label. Uh, it's a fashion and economic project that focuses on class, race, gender and democracy. And so the conceptual framework for Cover Slut comes out of um, a book I started writing in 2013 called Descent Without Modification. So uh, that book is uh, made up of interviews with radical and progressive women, um, artists, hackers, um, all sorts of women who went to art school or started their careers in the 1990s. And for me, the 1990s is very important in terms of protest, in terms of its connection to protest now. So um, at that time, it was in Seattle, the G8 uh, protest against the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, no Logo by Naomi Klein was published. And so that was the kind of backdrop. Um, and so now, uh, luckily, <laughs> your institution, Bergen Kunsthal, uh, will be publishing it in January uh, next year. And so, um, yeah, there's really a, um, a connection between those women who went to art school in that period mm. um, and also now um, the protests that have been going on like Black Lives Matter um, and Extinction Rebellion, the things of that. And so, yeah, that's kind of the backdrop to where Cover Slut comes from. Um, but yeah, cover slut is also a fascination for me to do with youth culture. So um, cover slut is like a post hippie neo tribal um, surf skate streetwear brand, but it's for all ages. It's like multi generational. It's multi racial, and it questions this idea of, about who has the right to be fashionable. Um, and so if you go on the CoverSlip website, you'll see that there's like a manifesto about it um, in the company structure. But the idea in terms of economics was to set up uh, a label that talks about capitalism um, and different methodologies of economics, like pay what you can and ethical um, methodologies. So we began by, um, I worked, I should say, in Belgium on this project in a small textile studio. 
and I worked with migrants, so mostly older Turkish ladies, ranging from 60 to 80 years old, um, young art students or um, recent graduates from, you know, art school, and also um, refugees, so from Afghanistan, um, Sudan, and other countries. And so we worked in the kind of anti-sweatshop, um, situation so everyone was either paid or they were paid in different ways you know and so uh, the idea was to take um, white t-shirts from capitalism you know that are made in China and to print them first with logos um, some of these logos come from the interviews from dissent without modification and uh, I know that your bookstore in Bergen, um, Kunsthal, they will be selling some of these um, T-shirts. Uh, but yeah, so to print these T-shirts and then we would sell them as pay what you can at different events. And then we'd collect that money together over like a year, year and a half and make an ecological collection. And so we ended up having like these four major collections. Uh, one of them, the first one is the basic collection with the white t-shirts. Should I show them now? I can share my screen with uh, the oh, images. Okay, yeah. Should I do that? Yeah. And then I'll, you can just tell me when to click through or when to stop. And, yeah. I'll, okay. Let's just try this. Share screen. So here we go. So yeah, so the basic collection, so that's the white t-shirts and the bags. Um, yeah, we, so the idea with CoverSet as well, I should say, is to come up with an alternative method and an alternative catwalks. So not following the normal um, fashion seasons of autumn, winter, spring, summer, and instead coming up with these kind of catwalks and these social events um, that are more inspired by things like rave culture or, or full moon parties or, yeah. So for example, um, um, for the basic collection, we would do pop-up stores. So we do it. We did a pop-up store at Eastside Projects in in England, uh, but also in Brussels during the art fair, where we would make the clothes live. So we'd print them live, and then we'd sew as well. And then um, we would have like models dancing. So we'd have a DJ, and the models would be dancing wearing the clothes. And then people would come into the booth and see this kind of action going on. And it was always kind of chaotic, you know, we'd have different people of different ages. And imagine my old Turkish ladies that obviously never been to an art fair. So this was really a fun experience for them. And so, yeah, this kind of like performance um, making. So people could see the making of the brand as well as, you know, not just buying the thing. And then we did a really fun event called a psychedelic movie night. So we tie dyed clothes um, in the studio. We made like a whole collection of like um, trousers and uh, tops and things. And um, I decided to um, create this night where we would be in an um, art center and we would like um, dance the collection into being. So uh, first part of the night, we made handmade soap. So I invited somebody to come and teach us how to make um, handmade um, biological laundry soap, which we could use afterwards. And obviously the public were involved in this. They could come to the workshops. And then afterwards, I invited a spiritual dance teacher to come and dance. So people would have the collection on and they would dance together. Um, and then after that, we would watch a psychedelic movie. So it's like quite an intense process of how to, you know, activate the fashion. Um, it wasn't like a straightforward catwalk. And so that also happened when we came to the Cult of the Kimono collection. And that was fun because I like to collaborate with like DJs and bands. So I found this amazing band in Paris and they came and they had like um, 
a singer from the Congo and I had contemporary dancers and it was all about whirling and movement and so yeah there was like that was quite a beautiful experience as well visually because of the the, the kimonos and because of the clothes and everything and then the last um, collection, which was totally nuts, <laughs> the Bella Tropica collection. Uh, this took place in a youth centre in the summer, uh, last summer, so it was very hot. And so um, we had made a collection, which was our ecological collection. So everything was made with ecological fabric, a, a printed ecological dye. Uh, we'd also made hammocks, you know, recycling uh, one, fabrics to make hammocks. And we set up in this park. And the fun thing is that this park is next to the, the main high court in Ghent. So it's like where the magistrates yep. thing is, um, you know, situated. But what's really funny, because it was like a holiday weekend and the crime in Ghent is quite low anyway, <laughs> there were no, nobody was on duty. Because there's a police station there, but like no one was there. And so I had envisioned everyone doing this mass catwalk. So I got basically 70 people to come wearing the previous collections and to walk around with signs and protesting about, you know, um, ecology and about um, new ways of thinking about the world. And I also hired a band of um, amateur professional African drummers to come in another collection and so there was like this massive chaos and then we would like walk down the street um from the youth center to the magistrates and there would be in the park and we and then all the local kids and their families came and yeah it was really a fun experience this kind of mass catwalk you know protesters mass catwalk yeah. uh, that's how i saw it and so that was kind of the last big um occasion for cover slurs yeah yeah, it was more like a festival. It was. It, was... it really became like a festival yeah. because I invited a DJ as well, and also we had all the hammocks in the trees. So all the kids were in the hammocks, and then you know we had like food and things, and yeah, it was really nice as well because Ramadan. It was like just at the end of Ramadan, so we had to take that into account of like when we could serve the food and yeah. you know like things like that. You have to really because I actually. Cover slut also, you know, to be able to do it, I had to do a residency in Ghent for those two years. And I actually lived in the same neighborhood, the same Turkish neighborhood that all my old ladies lived in. So I would see them in the supermarket, I'd see them at the bus stop. And then you, you I kind of understood, you know, what they needed or what they were into or what they weren't into. And of course I pushed them to do things, you know, like to go to the art fair, to, to do psychedelic dance and, yeah, I mean, it was fascinating um, when you've got different mixes of culture and age, you know, but that that's the um, that was always the intention, the goal of Coverslur, you know, as a fashion label, that it has to be for for everybody. You know? Yeah, it really embraces this competence of the collective. And yeah, through through that uh, alternative for storytelling, assimilation of information, you create this uh, place for hopeful protest. Um, yeah, and th thanks to COVID, we won't be having a festival uh, this year uh, or anything <laughs> close to in Bergen Kinstall, but the, the cover collection uh, is uh, available for, for sale at the Bergen Kinstall bookstore now. And uh, as you mentioned uh, a bit uh, earlier, the, the book Descent for Modification, where cover was kind of born from, uh, is being published by Kinstall in uh, January. Uh, which will be launched uh, through a talk uh, between yourself and Prem Krishnamurthy as a, an episode of Home Cooking, uh, scheduled for January 15th, I believe. So uh, you can find out more about Grace's practice through that. And Grace, I will, uh, I hope to edit in the uh, videos of Cover Slut now, the, the, the festival at Ghent and the Cult of the Kimono Collection, so people can get bigger idea of the project. Thank you so much for the conversation. It was a pleasure talking again today as always.
Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it's like fun to talk to you again as well. Yeah. <laughs> Since we met on Skype, it makes sense for us to do this conversation on Skype. So, yeah, an age ago, but yeah. <laughs> Great. Cool. I'll talk to you later, Grace, then. Okay, okay then. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.